All right. And without further ado, Research to Practice Gastrointestinal Cancer Management in North Carolina Updates for 2020 with Michael Lee, MD. Uh, Michael Lee is a translational investigator in gastrointestinal cancers, particularly colorectal cancers, focusing on drug development and design of early phase clinical trials for, of novel therapies. He's a clinical researcher designing and writing clinical trials in patients with gastrointestinal cancers and designing correlate, correlative studies to determine biomarkers of susceptibility or resistance. In addition, he is also involved in preclinical research necessary for drug development and novel pathophysiologic discoveries. And uh, welcome, Dr. Lee. So glad to have you here today. Thank you. And Dr. Lee, what's, what's one thing we should know about you that isn't on that uh, professional uh, description there? Well, um, I have two very young little boys, um, and so you can imagine uh, working from home and trying to call patients and conduct virtual visits from home is a, is a huge challenge. So uh, it's been really interesting uh, in the time of COVID. Well, hats off to you for, for all that you do and, and all that you manage. Um, I mentioned poll everywhere. This first one's a softball, it always is. Uh, this one may be particularly so. Which of the following is not a form of gastrointestinal cancer? A, stomach, B, pancreatic, C, liver, or D, cervix? So uh, while you're taking a look at that and answering that, I will mention that this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. William A. Wood, MD, Master of Public Health, and CPD have no staff, have no relevance with financial relationship or financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Michael Lee, MD, has no financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Michael Lee, MD, receives speaking fees and research support from Genentech Roche. The speaker has no other relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And let's take a look at that poll. Uh, Dr. Lee, we're, uh, our audience is as uh, sharp as ever, and uh, I th they're really uh, trending towards this answer D. How are they doing today? A hundred percent of you are correct. Great, great. I well, I don't answer today. So. <laughs> All right, great. Well, I, I uh, promise everyone. I know you've got some questions that are not quite that easy at the end. So, uh, but our audience is, uh, pays close attention. So we'll look for for uh, three more questions towards the end, and then an opportunity to share questions to share your questions. And without further ado, gastrointestinal cancer management in North Carolina updates for 2020 with Michael Lee, MD. Great, thank you, Tim. So um, thanks again for inviting me to, um, to speak. As you can imagine, this is a pretty broad topic um, addressing the wealth, uh, the breadth of GI cancers and how uh, to manage them. And so I wanted to focus today's talks really uh, on things that are practice changing, things we should be looking into based on research that's come out within the last year uh, in particular, and also looking at novel therapy options that are available and knowing to, how to test for who is going to be a candidate for each of these. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the key points to take away, among other things, are to discuss optimal management for patients with advanced hepatocellular carcinoma with normal liver function, discussing new targeted therapy options in subsets of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer based on uh, underlying biomarkers, and discussing the optimal duration and course of adjuvant therapy for stage three colon cancer. There are other things we'll be discussing as well. These are just a few of the take home points. Next slide, please. So some of the key areas I'd like to discuss include systemic therapy options for metastatic gastroesophageal cancers, systemic therapy options for unresectable or metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma, systemic therapy options for metastatic cholangiocarcinoma, a review of adjuvant therapy options for pancreatic cancer after resection, uh, discussing biomarkers and other novel therapies in pancreatic cancer, uh, that's metastatic, and then discussing, as I mentioned before, adjuvant chemotherapy and particularly duration in colon cancer as a review, and also discussing new targeted therapy options for metastatic colorectal cancer. Next slide, please. 
I'll just start with a few introductory cases just to kind of think through as a pretest for what we know, and we'll come back to these questions at the end. So, so kind of pay attention as we go through the, the, the topics. The first case, um, you meet a 60-year-old man with newly diagnosed cholangiocarcinoma with bone and lung metastases. You decide to send for next-generation sequencing and additional testing and start first-line standard chemotherapy with gemcitabine and cisplatin, but unfortunately, he eventually progresses, although he still has an intact performance status of one. What are the next treatment options that, which of the next treatment options would not be indicated based on the results of biomarker testing? So um, you can see is it an option to get pembrolizumab if he's MSI high, to get penigatinib if you had FGFR2 amplification, uh, pemigatinib if had an FGFR2 fusion, or full FOX if no actionable other aberration is noted? Next slide. Phase two, um, we meet a 56-year-old woman who was diagnosed with resectable pancreatic adenocarcinoma who underwent a Whipple resection with negative margins and had PT2N0 disease, which is uh, which of the following statements is not true about adjuvant therapy? Number one, adjuvant fulfirinox results in superior overall survival compared to adjuvant gemcitabine. Number two, adjuvant gemcitabine nabpaclitaxel results in superior disease-free survival compared to adjuvant gemcitabine. Or number three, adjuvant gemcitabine capecitabine results in superior overall survival compared to adjuvant gemcitabine. Okay, next slide. Final case, and then we'll get into it. So you meet a 49-year-old woman who was diagnosed with metastatic sequel adenocarcinoma with peritoneal carcinomatosis. She received first-line full foxeria plus bevacizumab and then eventually progressed. She still has an intact performance status of zero. Which of the following next-line treatment options would be the best choice based on the results of biomarker testing? So A, if she had a BRP 600E mutation, she could get encorafin and placetuximab. B, if she were MSI high, she could get ipilimumab monotherapy. C, if she had a DRAF B600E mutation, she could get arenotecan plus ituximab. Or D, if she had a KRS mutation, she could get atezolizumab plus covimagnin. All right, next slide, please. We laid out some of the few topics. Let's start with systemic therapies for advanced gastroesophageal cancers. So we have a wealth of um, cytotoxic and targeted therapy options for gastroesophageal cancers. The current landscape, um, exclusive of immune checkpoint inhibitors, which I'm going to describe on the next few slides, um, is, is laid out as thus. So in the first line, the standard treatment that most of us recommend would be a combination of uh, fluoropyrimidine and a platinum agent. Most commonly, we end up giving full FOX, although variants such as 5-fuse cisplatin or capecitabine cisplatin are certainly reasonable. Obviously, it's already a standard of care to check for HER2 amplification. As it's were present and based on the TOGA study, we would recommend adding trastuzumab to the first-line chemotherapy. For second-line therapy, um, paclitaxel plus um is a standard of care based on the rainbow study for adenocarcinomas. Ramucerumab, of course, is an, uh, is an anti-angiogenic um, monoclonal antibody, so you have to consider that. The biggest issue is that paclitaxel, um, similar to oxaliplatin, can cause neuropathy. And so it's often commonly seen that patients may have uh, too much neuropathy coming out of their first-line therapy to, to facilitate really going on to second-line taxane. And as such, uh, for these patients, I typically will give a second-line arenotecan-based therapy, although we don't have the same kind of level of phase three uh, trial-based data as we do for paclitaxel plus bramucerumab. In the third-line setting, uh, traditional cytotoxic options include if not previously treated with these agents, arenotecan or taxane. Recently, the, the FDA had also approved a pure cell plus trifluoridine based on the TAG study in the third line setting. Now, obviously, our paradigms have evolved beyond this um, and in, involve immune checkpoint inhibitors. Many of us are already aware that uh, the current FDA uh, approval for third line pembrolizumab includes patients who are PDL1 positive. Next slide, please. So I just want to review um, some of the data underlying immune checkpoint inhibitors in metastatic gastroesophageal cancers. So as I mentioned, um, the third bullet point points out that, as many of us are already aware, um, and kind of the first um, FDA approval in the setting was for pembrolizumab in the third line setting uh, for gastroesophageal adenocarcinomas with a pdl one uh, 
test score of one or greater. However, uh, and, and also many of us are aware of the data supporting the use of uh, pembrolizumab uh, in the second line and beyond setting for any, pay, any MSI high disease, um, uh, which is important for essentially all of our GI malignancies. However, more recently, there was data that also described the use of um, pembrolizumab in the second line setting for patients with esophageal squamous cell carcinomas with a PDL1 CPS score of 10 or greater. And I think you know, that's what I'd like to flesh out some more. Before I move on to that, I do want to point out that um, further analysis of the Keno 059 study from the third line phase does perhaps indicate that you know, most of these studies have shown that the greater the, the PDL1 staining is, the greater the level of um, benefit with at least PD1 or PDL1 inhibitor monotherapies. And we do tend to see a greater degree of response among patients who have a higher CPS score among the, as compared to those who have a lower CPS score. Uh, next slide, please. But I wanted to particularly spend some time discussing the squamous cell cancer data since this is relatively newer and, and occurred within the last year. So I want to make sure we're all um, aware of this. So, sorry, I just need to. So we had been aware really since GI ASCO last year that the CPS score made a difference in soft dual, uh cancers. So Kojima et al. had presented data from Keynote 181 that looked at um, how survival looked in patients who either had a high PDL1 score with a CPS of 10 or greater versus those who were lower, um, how patients did who had squamous cell carcinoma versus adenocarcinoma, et cetera. Uh, in this study, patients were randomized to receive either pembrolizumab versus um, standard of care chemotherapy. And we had seen even at that time that pembrolizumab resulted in a better overall survival among patients who had a CPS score of 10 or higher. Now this kind of, this analysis from that time was a mixture of histologies of both squamous cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. However, more recent data that was presented at ASCO 2019 uh, by Manish Shah and colleagues actually broke this down further and looked at um, based on the different histologies of adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma, along with uh, the CPS uh, PDL1 staining, uh, how, how things broke out. And you can see here that uh, the median survival among specifically squamous cell carcinomas with a high CPS score of 10 or greater was even better at 10.1 months compared to still 6.7 months among patients who. Um, had a, a CPS score that was lower than that uh, with chemotherapy. Uh, or, or sorry, uh, it was 6.7 months a month patients got chemotherapy as opposed to the pembrolizumab. Consequently, um, this led to the FDA approval of pembrolizumab for patients who had a metastatic esophageal squamous cell carcinoma with a CPS score of 10 or greater in the second line and beyond setting. Because as we can see, not only was pembrolizumab comparable to chemotherapy, it actually beat chemotherapy. It's also interesting to see that at least on this curve, you don't see um, many times with uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, you'll see that the curves cross, meaning that there's a subgroup of patients who did better and then a subgroup of patients who did worse. Here you don't see these curves crossing. It's pretty uniform that in this group of patients, pembrolizumab resulted in, a, in improved survival as compared to chemotherapy. Squamous cell carcinomas are relatively less commonly seen than, than adenocarcinomas, but again, this is important. It is very important that you're testing patients for PDL1, uh, IHC, using the CPS score, the combined positive score, to make sure you're assessing whether this is going to be a good option in the second line setting and beyond. Next slide, please. So just to recap how we should incorporate immune checkpoint inhibitors into our paradigms. Um, as we had just described, pembrolizumab um, should be given in the second line setting for patients with esophageal squamous cell carcinoma with, with a CPS score of 10 or higher or who are microsatellite unstable. And in the third line setting, pembrolizumab can be given with a CPS score of one or greater. Um, now there have been a range of other studies that have been presented and published describing use of immune checkpoint inhibitors in earlier lines of therapy. 
that data has been overall more mixed. And so overall, I, I don't recommend at this point still, you know, deviating from this paradigm. Um, unless there were a very clear risk benefit discussion, but current, but as things currently stand, um, you know, the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors in earlier lines of therapy, like in the first line study, uh, certainly is not FDA approved and is not within uh, consensus guidelines like the NCCN guidelines. Next slide, please. So next let's talk about um, hepatobiliary cancers and novel therapy approaches. Next slide, please. So we're looking about patients who, at patients who have unresectable uh, or metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, there are now actually quite a range of options available in the first line therapy or the second line therapy spaces. And I'll walk through these in a, in a moment, but a few things to point out. The first, these do matter, uh, the child PD score matters. Obviously with hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, patients have underlying hepatic dysfunction and cirrhosis. So we absolutely must be considering what is the underlying child P score, what is the underlying bilirubin. Um, the vast majority of the studies that uh, established data for each of these therapies uh, enrolled patients who had child P score of A, or if anything beyond that, at best, perhaps A7. But we don't have prospective data for most of these therapy options for patients who are top use score of B or beyond, which is actually the majority of the patients we see in our clinic. So we have to take some of the trial data with a grain of salt for that group of patients because the data is not generalizable to that population. Um, now, looking at these therapy options, you can see atezolizumab plus bevacizumab is new. I'm going to talk about that in more detail. Um, until now, most of us have been accustomed to seeing serafinib or lenvatinib, which are anti-angiogenic tyrosine kinase inhibitors, as the first-line therapy options. We'll talk about some of the data for nivolumab. And then some of the second-line therapy options, again, have focused on anti-angiogenic tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as regorafenib, um, cabazantinib. Um, there's also ramucirumab, which I think got cut off on this slide but is FDA approved for, uh, which is an, uh, an antibody that is an anti-angiogenic antibody um, for patients who have a high AFP. And also there's a role now for uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, both nivolumab or pembrolizumab monotherapies, or the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, which is also FDA approved within the past year based on response rate data. Next slide, please. I want to spend some time talking about the results supporting the use of first line atezolizumab and bevacizumab. Now, we have uh, had emerging data for the efficacy of this combination from an earlier kind of phase 1b study that had been done that ENC had participated in as well, uh, the GO30140 study, which has been very promising. But obviously, in order to, to, for this to become considered a possible standard of care, we needed a randomized phase three study, and that was the Imbrae 150 study. So in this study, patients who were enrolled all had locally advanced or metastatic uh, or un and or unresectable hepatocellular carcinoma that had been previously not received systemic therapy. This was a worldwide study and enrolled patients both in Asia and in the US, which is important because we often, uh, these different areas have different underlying histologies and or different underlying etiologies of hepatocellular carcinoma regarding hepatitis B versus C or non-viral. Um, and patients were also stratified based on macrovascular invasion and or after hepatic spread and based on their AFP. They were randomized two to one to receive either the combination of atezolizumab, a PDL1 antibody, plus bevacizumab, an anti-angiogenic antibody, versus serafinib, which is our standard of care anti-angiogenic tyrosine kinase inhibitor. There were co-primary endpoints in the study of overall survival and progression-free survival as assessed by an independent review facility. Next slide, please. So here we can see the results of the co-primary endpoints. This data was originally presented at ESMO Asia in 2019, and uh, this slide was um, prepared by Dr. Gale. Uh, and shown at the GI ASCO in earlier this year. Uh, 
This study met both of its co-primary endpoints of overall survival and progression-free survival. So here you can see atezolizumab plus bevacizumab resulted in a significant improvement in overall survival compared to serafinib. The overall survival with the combination uh, actually had not yet been reached at the time of the data cutoff with a median survival follow-up of 8.6 months versus serafinib, which had a median survival of 13.2 months. This is pretty comparable to what we had seen in some of the other serafinib phase three studies. Progression-free survival was similarly significantly better with the tezolizumab plus bevacizumab compared to serafinib at 6.8 months versus 4.3 months. Next slide, please. In terms of side effect profiles, atezolizumab plus bevacizumab had side effects we generally consider to be expected based on the mechanisms of action of these drugs. So with bevacizumab, the most common side effects that we're seeing included hypertension, uh, with a fair amount of about 15% having grade three or four hypertension. Um, proteinuria was also seen fairly commonly, but again, about 5% or less of patients had grade three or four proteinuria. Um, and other side effects that we're seeing included um, diarrhea, um, fever, and some LFT abnormalities, although mostly grade one or two. As you can see, serafinib had its usually seen side effect profiles, including diarrhea, palmar plantar erythrodysesthesia, or hand foot syndrome, um, decreased appetite hypertension as well as an anti-angiogenic um, side effect. And at GISCO, Dr. Gale had also presented quality of life data from the study. There were many slides that were presented, but here is an illustrative example that actually showed that the combination of atezolizumab and bevacizumab also improved the time and deterioration of physical functioning as compared to serafinib, which I think is intuitive based on what we had seen, but I think it all goes to show that, you know, atezolizumab and bevacizumab not only resulted in improved uh, overall and progression-free survival, but also actually did translate into improving quality of life for patients. Next slide, please. Now, I, we haven't yet gotten FDA approval, I'll point out, for atezolizumab and bevacizumab. Uh, the applications have been submitted, it's pending, but um, it does now appear in NCCN guidelines. And this is certainly, um, based on the quality of data that's seen, I think something that we can consider to be practice changing. Just a few other things to point out. So, ipilimumab and nivolumab did recently receive accelerated FDA approval. This is based on results from the Checkmate 040 study, which was a modestly sized single arm study of patients and showed a response rate of about 33% with the combination. Um, it was not a randomized study, obviously with accelerated approval. Uh, in order to get full approval, it would need a larger randomized study but it does have a higher response rate than some of the uh, PD-1 or inhibitor monotherapy options. So it's something just to consider if you have a very fit patient, you're more willing to tolerate immunotherapy-related adverse events. Next slide, please. And again, that's in the second line setting. The final thing I wanna point out while we're talking about immunotherapies is data from Checkmate 459, which was also presented at ESMO uh, last year. Now, as we know, nivolumab had received accelerated FDA approval in uh, the second line setting. And then uh, Checkmate 459 was looking to assess how nivolumab compared to serafinib. It was trying to test whether nivolumab would be superior to first line serafinib. And uh, here we can see the results for overall survival. So you can see the median overall survival for nivolumab was numerically trending towards being a little bit better than the, than the median survival for serafinib, 16.4 versus 14.7 months. Here you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve. However, this fell a bit shy of being statistically significant. The p-value was um, 0.075. And here you can see the, the the curves, while they do perhaps eventually start to diverge, don't really start diverging until later in the course. And as you can see, um, it wasn't enough to render the hazard ratio to be statistically significant. You can also see the progression-free survival was not, was not, did not appear to be significantly different. 
as a result, nivolumab um, did not, the, in this study at least, nivolumab did not meet its endpoint of being superior to serafinib. Now, um, nivolumab perhaps could play a role in first-line therapy. Uh, there is a wealth of data that has actually shown that nivolumab is reasonably tolerated among patients who have um, a more marginal child Pew score. Now, obviously, this was not in these randomized phase three trials, uh, as those patients were not eligible for those studies. But I do consider nivolumab, if I have a patient who is either not a candidate for anti-angiogenic therapy or tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy, if I have a patient who has significant cardiovascular morbidities, who I feel is at very high risk of bleeding, perhaps because they have significant variceal issues, um, but has good performance status, and you know, we all agree it's consistent with trying some form of systemic therapy, then I think that's a situation where nivolumab could play a role. Um, and in NCCN guidelines, it's basically listed as such. However, I would not routinely recommend nivolumab over the current standard of care tyrosine kinase inhibitors of serafinib or lenalidomide, um, based on the data we have at this time. Next slide, please. The other data I want to make sure that we discuss is um, how to tease out the results from the Keynote 240 study. As I was alluding to before, um, there are several now um, immune checkpoint inhibitors that are approved in the second line setting for uh, advanced hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab as well, and, and these have accelerated approval. Now, the Keynote 240 study was meant to be the, the definitive randomized phase three study that uh, would facilitate getting full approval for pembrolizumab in the second line space. And this randomized patients to receive second line pembrolizumab versus placebo. Uh, in this study, there were co-primary endpoints of overall survival and progression-free survival. And this is an important facet in, in terms of how we uh, interpret the results of the study. When there are co-primary endpoints, as opposed to a single primary endpoint, um, it basically ends up splitting the alpha value. And what that basically means is that in order to be deemed uh, a statistically significant uh, finding, there's a more stringent p-value that has to be met in order to determine that the result wasn't solely just based on chance, uh, based on the, on the statistical design. Because you're looking at a couple of endpoints, you have a, more chances to um, get a result by chance, um, as opposed to if you had a single endpoint. So because of this, um, we can't assume that a p-value of less than 0.05 is what's considered significant. So when you look at the results for overall survival and the primary analysis of progression-free survival, you can see that with overall survival, uh, the pembrolizumab did trend towards better overall survival as compared to placebo. Um, the hazard ratio was 0.78. The p-value was 0.02. However, it needed a p-value of 0.017 based on that, that statistical design to, to be considered as meeting the threshold for statistical significance. and technically didn't meet that. Progression-free survival was a similar story. Based on the primary analysis, um, while pembrolizumab trended towards improved progression-free survival, and again, did not quite meet the threshold that was required for statistical significance, um, uh, uh, for, for statistical significance um, because it would have required a p-value of 0 0.002 to meet that threshold. Consequently, um, the, the way to interpret this data is that technically this Kena 240 study could not confirm statistically that pembrolizumab was better than placebo uh, in terms of overall survival or progression-free survival. However, clinically, I don't think this is dissuading us of the role of pembrolizumab, right? I think you'll agree with me that um, pembrolizumab clearly is playing a role here and certainly is, is trending towards better results than placebo. So there are some times when, if the definitive phase three study was not technically positive in the past, that FDA has stripped 
the approval for an accelerated approved drug if the data from the definitive phase three study actually definitively concludes um, disproves efficacy, but that did not happen in this case. I think based on this, you know, we just have to take these, the results of this study with a grain of salt and understand kind of the, the reasons why it wasn't considered statistically significant, but I do think this still does play a role in, in this setting, especially because patients don't have a lot of other great options. Now, there, there are other options, but I think they're different, a different class of drugs, and I think um, we just have to interpret and choose therapies in light of these, um, this data. Next slide, please. So here's our summary of the current landscape of systemic therapy options. Um, to, to summarize again, atezolizumab plus bevacizumab um, was based on the Imbrave 150 data, as I described, um, which showed that it was superior to serafinib. Um, in my mind, this is going to be practice changing and is a standard of care, but obviously other therapy options include serafinib and lenfatinib. Um, and as I was describing, if a patient is not a candidate for a tyrosine kinase inhibitor or anti-angiogenic therapy, in general, then nivolumab would be a reasonable consideration. Although again, the result was not statistically significant from the phase three study. Second line therapy options, you have a range of tyrosine kinase inhibitor based options or of immunotherapy based options. Um, and now we have the option of ipilimumab and nivolumab as well, uh, as uh, based on the response rate of 33%, although we don't yet have more detailed data um, or randomized data regarding this combination. There are a lot of ongoing studies uh, in the first line setting. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, and so there are a lot of questions uh, to continue to address. So there are multiple additional clinical trials that are ongoing that have additional novel combinations of immune checkpoint inhibitors or anti-angiogenic therapies or other therapies. And we're eagerly awaiting the results of many of these studies. Um, we still don't have a great understanding of predictive or prognostic biomarkers. Subgroup analyses from Imbrave 150 showed that patients had benefit regardless of the etiology of the hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, uh, there were responses across the, uh, the range of pdl one staining. And so you don't have a very good understanding at this point of biomarkers that may guide patient selection. Um, as I said, we have very limited options for child two class B patients, which is of many of our patients in the clinic. Um, but seeing now that we do have therapy options that are well tolerated and have good evidence of efficacy, there are ongoing questions of how some of these systemic therapy options may do in earlier stages of disease, for example, high-risk patients after resection, and there are studies ongoing in, the, in that sphere as well. Um, one thing to point out is that as medical oncologists, we all need to be very um, aware of the risks of anti-angiogenic therapies, uh, in particular bleeding, uh, and with patients having underlying cirrhosis, um, it is important, especially before atezolizumab and bevacizumab treatment, that we ensure they've had up-to-date variceal screening. Um, in the Embrave 150 study, patients were required to have um, updated uh, uh, EGDs to assess for varices and have standard of care management of varices prior to starting on therapy. So this is something we should make sure we're considering um, because there is some risk of bleeding. The, the rates of bleeding that were seen in Embrave 150 were not terribly high, but again, there were a couple of events um, and the, events that were, and everyone had been uh, screened during the screening process for varices. So again, it's important we're, we're considering that. Overall though, it's, it's a very exciting time for hepatocellular carcinoma. There was, as we all know, a very long duration of time where serafinib was really the only therapy that was available and FDA approved. And now we have this huge wealth of options. And, and at this point, honestly, the biggest question is which clinical trial do you enroll one of these patients on if they have good hepatic function and you know, how can we move the bar forward even more? And how are, we, how are we to sequence these therapy options in terms of one after the other? Next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to next touch on systemic therapy options in cholangiocarcinoma, in advanced cholangiocarcinoma. Next slide, please. So 
As most of us are aware, the current standard of care for first-line therapy for metastatic biliary tract and gallbladder cancers is generally considered to be gemcitabine and cisplatin based on the results of the ABC02 study. We can see that gemcitabine and cisplatin resulted in superior overall survival and progression-free survival compared to gemcitabine monotherapy. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to point out that for a long time, we did not have a strong phase three trial data uh, for the use of second line therapy, but we now do thanks to the ABC06 study, uh, which was presented at ASCO last year. And this was a study that randomized patients uh, to receive either second line full FOX after receiving gemcitabine cisplatin um, versus uh, just best supportive care alone. And here we can see that the overall survival is significantly better for patients who received the second line full FOX as opposed to just best supportive care. It was 6.2 months versus 5.3 months, but, but arguably I think more impressively here, you can see the six month and 12 month survival rates were quite a bit better with the uh, full FOX arm compared to the best supportive care alone. So for patients um, who don't have other targeted therapy options, I would say that this is um, the best way to go. Uh, and now we have phase three trial data supporting the use of second line full FOX. Next slide, please. However, we're increasingly learning that there are a range of biomarkers that are actionable and targetable in uh, cholangiocarcinomas and gallbladder cancers. Um, this is a slide that was taken from a recent review that was published. So I wanna point out that several of these are actionable. I'm gonna talk about FGFR2 fusions and IDH mutations in more detail on the next few slides. Um, but I do wanna point out there's also some phase two data supporting the use of BRAF uh, com inhibitor combinations for the 5% of patients with an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma that are BRAF mutants. Uh, there are also some case series that describe a benefit for HER2 directed therapies in patients who have HER2 amplifications. And um, there are, um, obviously, as I described before, there are options for patients who are microsatellite unstable or for pembrolizumab. One other thing, just to make sure I mention, for really any advanced malignancy is that if there were an MTRAC fusion that were found, there are MTRAC inhibitors that are approved, although these are very rare across all populations at less than 1%. But let's look at the data supporting F, uh, the use of FGFR inhibitors, uh, as this is important. Next slide, please. So uh, data was presented from the FIGHT202 study um, using the FGFR2 inhibitor hemigatinib. And this was a single arm study uh, that enrolled patients who had FGFR2 fusions or rearrangements uh, in, in advanced cholangiocarcinoma in the second line and beyond setting. Um, now this uh, FGFRC fusion or rearrangement is not terribly common, but it was found in 9% of the patients who are screened. Uh, so about one in 10 of your patients with cholangiocarcinoma may well have this, in particular uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. In this group of patients, the response rate with pemigatinib was 35%, and there were 3% uh, of patients who actually had a complete response. And among the patients who had a response, the duration of response is quite long, with a median of 9.1 months. Next slide, please. Here you can see the results for progression-free survival up top and the uh, overall survival up down below. And you can see the median progression-free survival is 6.9 months, but there were quite a few patients who had survival that stretched on for even longer than progression-free survival that stretched on even longer than that. Overall survival, the median was 21 months, which is actually quite good for cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, next slide, please. Regarding side effects, uh, the most common side effect that was seen was hyperphosphatemia. So this is something you should just be aware of as you're prescribing this drug. Um, based on this data, as I described, the FDA has approved hemigatinib um, for FGFR2 um, fusion or re rearrangement based uh, cholangiocarcinomas. So this is something we'll need to be familiar with. For the most part, hyperphosphatemia was mild at grade one or two and usually can be managed by starting with a low phosphate diet and prescribing phosphate binders if needed. Other common side effects included alopecia, uh, dysgeusia, diarrhea, fatigue, uh, and stomatitis. Um, 
and, and going on from here, as you can see. Next slide, please. Now, regarding some of the other um, biomarkers that have been found in cholangiocarcinoma, I do just want to briefly mention the Clarity trial, which looked at the use of ibocytinib, which is an IDH1 inhibitor in patients with IDH1 mutant cholangiocarcinoma. Now, ibocytinib is currently FDA approved in IDH mutant um, uh, leukemias, but um, does not currently have an FDA approval in cholangiocarcinoma. Clarity was a phase three randomized study of ibocytinib versus placebo um, after one or two prior therapies enrolled 185 patients. Primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And here you can see the results for progression-free survival, which did show a statistically significant improvement. But you can also see that the median was not terribly impressive. The median progression-free survival with ibocytinib was 2.7 months versus 1.4 months with placebo. Um, you do see there is some subgroup of patients that have longer durations of progression-free survival, 32% being free of progression at six months and 22% free of progression at 12 months. But these data are overall um, less impressive, certainly if you compare it against the pemigatinib based data. Um, so ibocytinib is not currently FDA approved in this setting. Um, there are ongoing studies that are looking at how we can improve on therapy options or trying novel therapies in the IDH1 and 2 uh, populations, since this does look like something that we think should be actionable. I think this improvement in progression-free survival is a start, but unfortunately, I don't think it's something that's considered to be particularly practice-changing, um, just given how modest the numbers are um, and the lack of an FDA approval uh, concomitant with that. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about some updated results from pancreatic cancer. Um, so one of the spheres to talk about here is pancreatic cancer, uh, is adjuvant chemotherapy after resection for resectable pancreatic cancer. Now, as we know, um, there are a lot of paradigms that can use pancreatic cancer, um, including neoadjuvant therapy, um, you know, borderline resectable disease, um, et cetera. But here we're drilling down on the patients who were deemed to have resectable disease, went straight to surgical resection, and are now getting adjuvant therapy. Now, the current standards of care for this um, from phase three drug trials have included uh, modified fulfirinox, gemcitabine, capecitabine, or gemcitabine, or arguably 5 few alone um, for patients, ranging from, you know, patients obviously have to be more fit to receive the more aggressive multidrug regimens and can get the less, um, and can be less fit to receive the monotherapy-based regimens. And obviously, the fulfirinox data was based on the Prodige study, which was published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago now, um, which showed a significant improvement compared in overall survival compared to gemcitabine, um, and also an improvement in, in the median investigator-assessed uh, disease-free survival. Gemcitabine plus capecitabine similarly showed an improvement in median overall survival compared to gemcitabine alone. You can see that the improvement is more modest. Um, there are a few reasons for that, uh, including patient selection uh, based on the, uh, the design of the studies, um, but also based on the agents, of course. Uh, you can see that the disease-free survival was not particularly better for gemcitabine capecitabine compared to gemcitabine monotherapy, though. Um, next slide, please. One thing I want to make sure we're aware of is the data from the APACT study. So this was a study that looked at gemcitabine plus nabpaclitaxel in the adjuvant setting. Now, obviously, we're all very familiar with gemcitabine nabpaclitaxel as it is considered one of our standard of care options for patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer. However, we're also all aware that there are different therapy options that are more or less effective in patients with metastatic disease versus um, in the adjuvant setting. And the APAC study was negative. The primary endpoint was disease-free survival as assessed by an independent review facility. And here we can see that gemcitabine plus napaclitaxel did not result in a significant improvement in this endpoint of independently assessed disease-free survival compared to gemcitabine monotherapy, 19.4 months versus 18.8 months. Now, when the investigator assessed disease-free survival, it did seem to result in a significant difference um, 
with gemcitabine nav hapitaxel having a result of 16.6 months versus gemcitabine at 13.7 months. Um, we don't have overall survival data yet. Um, you know, it's been hypothesized that actually having the investigator assessment can help in terms of determining, because many times patients who recur don't necessarily have radiographically detectable recurrence, but perhaps, you know, some increase in um, findings on scans along with um, clinical findings um, can be sufficient to clinically diagnose um, recurrence. Um, but, uh, and, and so that, that is thought to, to make a difference, right? Because if you look just based on scans versus, you know, the investigator assessing, you know, having clinical data, having CA199 data, you can ar argue that you may have a difference in when you would consider a patient to recur. Um, but um, based on the results of this, I don't think we should consider gemcitabine napapotaxel to be a standard uh, adjuvant therapy option. This would be considered to be a negative study. And for patients who are fit enough to receive gemcitabine now, Papatox, so you could argue, should they be receiving something, a regimen that has a higher level of data? Ideally, full furanox if possible. Next slide, please. Um, in pancreatic cancer, um, for systemic therapy options, um, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm just going to talk briefly about this. So, you know, we obviously have to full furanox and gemcitabine now, Paclitaxel. And there is some data supporting the use of gemcitabine and cisplatin um, if patients are, are BRCA uh, mutant. Um, uh, and we should be testing for microsatellite instability and BRCA germline mutations. Next slide, please. To highlight that point, we now know that Olaparib has been FDA approved for patients who are BRCA1 or 2 mutant uh, as in a maintenance therapy after full furanox. So olaparib is a PARP inhibitor that's been approved in a range of other uh, diseases. We know that PARP inhibitors have syn um, synthetic lethality among patients who, um, among tumors that arise in uh, a BRCA1 or 2 uh, mutant setting uh, because of particular uh, reliance on, uh, uh, because of the deficiency and homologous recombination that it occurs because of the underlying BRCA1 or 2 mutation makes these cells particularly dependent, uh, susceptible to olaparib therapy. BRCA1 and 2 mutations were found in about 6% of patients um, with pancreatic cancer. But in the US, it was, actually in, it was actually found at a somewhat higher rate of 9 to 10%. And, and there were actually some underlying differences in race that were found that were in screening for the underlying seminal phase 3 polo study that we should just be aware of. Next slide, please. In the polo study, this was one of the ASCO plenary talks uh, last year. Uh, this enrolled patients who had stable disease or response after receiving uh, at least 16 weeks of first-line platinum-based therapy, like full furanox or gemcitabine uh, cisplatin, um, to receive either uh, maintenance olaparib versus maintenance or placebo. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we can see that olaparib resulted in a significant improvement in progression-free survival compared to placebo. Um, with a median of 7.4 months versus 3.8 months. Interestingly, it did not result in a significant improvement in, in overall survival, although you, know, you could argue this data has more time to mature as well. Next slide, please. Um, the one thing to highlight is that there were several patients who had longer durations of disease control while on olaparib monotherapy. Olaparib does have you know, side, side effects that I think we need to be aware of. Um, it had higher rates of fatigue or asthenia, nausea, uh, anemia in particular, among other cytopenias, uh, decreased appetite and constipation, and required frequently uh, interruptions or dose reductions. Next slide, please. But based on this, all patients should be getting screened. Uh, all patients with pancreatic cancer should be getting screened for BRCA1 or 2 drumline mutations, given that this is actionable. Um, number one, for olaparib maintenance, and number two, I really want to make sure I'm treating these patients with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation with a platinum agent uh, because they have such greater sensitivity to this. Um, now, one limitation of the POLO study was that, you know, most of us are probably not putting patients on maintenance placebo. Uh, most of us, after induction, full furanox, are, really, are going to be giving them either full fury or at least a fluoropyrimidine as maintenance. Um, so we don't know how Leprid would do compared to one of these alternative maintenance cytotoxic strategies, um, but it is another option to consider. It's an oral therapy. Next slide, please. 
Unfortunately, there have been a few other negative phase three studies that were presented at GI ASCO this year, including the long-awaited um, study of gemcitabine and paclitaxel plus or minus PEG PH20 in patients who had high levels of um, um, who were biomarker selected. Um, uh, and, the, and unfortunately, this is these join a few other negative phase three studies as well. So we really need novel approaches, new clinical trials to continue to move the needle forward in metastatic pancreatic cancer. Next slide, please. Um, we have just a little bit of time to touch on adjuvant therapies in stage three colon cancer. So this is older data, so I'm gonna to touch on it more briefly, but I wanna make sure we've all discussed it. So um, we know that for a long time, six months of adjuvant fluoropromine oxaliplatin had been the standard of care based on the mosaic study. Um, but obviously you start running into problems of cumulative neurotoxicity and neuropathy with longer durations of treatment. The IDEA study um, was a pre-planned pooled analysis of six randomized phase three studies looking at whether three months of treatment was not inferior to six months with the primary endpoint of three-year disease-free survival. When you looked at the overall analysis, we could not necessarily conclude non-inferiority, but subgroup analyses were done, um, which do yield uh, conclusions that I think are um, actionable and are now in guidelines. Next, next slide, please. So the take home point from IDEA was that for patients who are lower risk, T1 through three and N1, uh, who receive KPOX, uh, we, could prove, we could demonstrate in this subgroup analysis that KPOX was non-inferior, uh, three months of KPOX was non-inferior to six months. And you can see there's a very strong trend towards actually being superior. We could not prove that among patients who received full FOX. Um, in patients who were higher risk, who had T4 or N2 disease, uh, we couldn't necessarily prove non-inferiority with KPOX um, for three months, but it's very close. Uh, the hazard ratio is 1.02. Whereas with full FOX, um, six months was actually significantly better than three months. The way this has been distilled into current guidelines is that for the lower risk patients, uh, three months of KPOX is my recommendation. Um, and for the higher risk T4 or N2 patients, Six months of therapy technically does have the best evidence, but it'd probably be reasonable to give three months of KPOX. Um, if you're giving full FOX-based therapy, you really should give six months. Um, there are updated results from this that are going to be discussed as an oral abstract at the virtual ASCO meeting this year, looking at the five-year disease-free survival. So that will further refine this and provide probably further data for the three months of KPOX. Next slide, please. There are a, a range of targeted therapy options in metastatic colorectal cancer. There are going to be several talks at the upcoming virtual ASCO that are highlighting some um, uh, new biomarkers or you know, giving more data on biomarker selected therapies. But I just wanna highlight a couple um, that we've known prior to the upcoming ASCO meeting. Next slide, please. I wanna particularly highlight BRFV600 E mutations. We've known for years that BRFV600 E mutations confer poor prognosis in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. It's found in about 10% of patients with colorectal cancer and a somewhat higher proportion among patients who are RAS wild type, since these are um, considered mutually exclusive. Um, combination therapies with BRF mutation of uh, BRF inhibitors um, have shown promising signals. Um, and you know, it's important to point out the updated results from the Beacon CRC study. This is a randomized phase three study enrolling patients with BRF mutant uh, <coughs> colorectal cancer with BRF B600E mutations in the second line and beyond setting to receive either triplet therapy with the BUF inhibitor and carafenib plus the MEK inhibitor binimetinib plus cetuximab versus doublet therapy of the carafenib plus cetuximab versus standard of care, which is arena tcan based chemotherapy plus cetuximab. The primary endpoints for overall survival and um, response rate. Next slide, please. The primary uh, uh, analysis for overall survival and response rate had been published in the New England Journal. Um, where you can see that both the triplet and the doublet independently resulted in improvement in overall survival. The triplet trended towards a better response rate than the doublet. Now, initially, a lot of us were talking about giving the triplet, to therapy, triplet therapy to patients because of this apparent in, improvement in overall survival and response rate as compared to the doublet, although this wasn't the primary endpoint, uh, the primary analysis that was done. Uh, next slide, please. 
However, I want to make sure we are very familiar with updated analysis from Beacon CRC, which Dr. Kopetz had presented at GI ASCO briefly and is being discussed in more detail at the upcoming virtual ASCO meeting, where we can see that the overall survival between the triplet versus the doublet was very comparable at 9.3 months, and both of these are better than the control arm at 5.9 months. Um, as a result, the FDA has approved the doublet specifically of Encoraf and Aplacetuximab. This should be considered the gold, uh, the gold, sta the gold standard treatment moving forward, the standard of care. So um, again, Encoraf and Aplacetuximab is the standard of care. Given where we live in North Carolina and the risks of infusion reactions with, cetu with cetuximab and CCN guidelines do allow for Encoraf and Aplacetuximab, there's less so really, we really don't have a ton of prospective data with pantumab as opposed to cetuximab in this setting, but I think you know, most of it is considered to be a reasonable extrapolation of the data that we do have. Next slide, please. Um, just highlighting the role of microsatellite instability, we're obviously all using pembrolizumab, aware of pembrolizumab, nivolumab, and ipilimumab, nivolumab in microsatellite unstable metastatic colorectal cancer. Next slide, please. So let's touch on our cases. To, so to go back to that first case to talk about, a um, 60-year-old man with newly diagnosed metastatic cholangiocarcinoma who has progressed the first-line gemcitabine cisplatin, um, but still has good performance status. Next slide, please. Which of the following treatment options would, as, would not be indicated based on your next, uh, based on biomarker testing? Would you not give pembrolizumab if microsatellite unstable? Would you not give pemigatinib if FGFR2 amplified? Would you not give pemigatinib if FGFR2 fusion? Or would you not give full FOX if there's no other actionable aberration? All right, and if you would take just a few more seconds to uh, respond to this poll, if you've not already. Dr. Lee, how are they doing? Great. Um, I think most of you are getting the correct answer. So again, uh, the key takeaway from this was that pemigatinib is a new, a recently FDA approved option for patients who have FGFR2 fusions, um, which means it is not a therapy option for patients with FGFR2 amplification. Uh, that's an important distinction to be aware of. Um, again, microsatellite unstable disease, uh, pembrolizumab is FDA approved for the, the wealth of, of these um, for across the breadth of microsatellite unstable cancer types. Um, so, so great. 92% um, of you all had the right answer. Next slide, please. So the next case we had talked about was looking at a 56-year-old woman who had resectable pancreatic head adenocarcinoma who underwent a lymphoma resection with negative margins who had PT2N0 disease. Next slide. So which of the following can we conclude which of the following is not correct about adjuvant therapy? A, adjuvant fulfurinox results in, does adjuvant fulfurinox not result in better overall survival compared to gemcitabine? B, does adjuvant gemcitabine nab paclitaxel not result in better disease-free survival compared to gemcitabine? Uh, or C, does adjuvant gemcitabine capecitabine not result in better overall survival compared to gemcitabine? Again, this is which is not correct. All right, and again, if you take uh, about 10 more seconds, please go ahead and, uh, and this is all anonymous, so uh, take your best guess at, at the answer. And uh, Dr. Lee, how are they doing this Great. time? Um, I think uh, most of you all have gotten the right answer. Um, and maybe it's just the not wording that's tricking, uh, tricking, uh, tripping people up, but um, as we discussed with a negative result of APACT, uh, I would, say that adjuvant gemcitabine nab paclitaxel is, does not result in better disease-free survival compared to gemcitabine. Um, we know from the Prodige study that adjuvant fulfurinox does result in better survival compared to gemcitabine. And we know from SPAC4 that adjuvant gemcitabine capecitabine does result in better overall survival compared to gemcitabine. Next slide. So you meet a 49-year-old woman who was diagnosed with metastatic sequel adenocarcinoma with peritinocarcinomatosis. She'd gotten first-line full flux bevacizumab and then progressed, but still has a great performance status. So next slide. Which is the best choice based on results of biomarker testing? So choice A, if she has a BRV600E mutation, would I give encorafenib plus cetuximab? 
Choice B, if she's microsatellite unstable, will I give her ipilimumab monotherapy? Choice C, if she has a BRP600E mutation, am I going to give her a reunity against tuximab? Or D, if she has a KRS mutation, am I going to give her a tezolizumab plus cabimatinib? All right, and again, just take about 10 more seconds and uh, put what you think is the best answer in there. And uh, Dr. Lee, how are they doing this time? Perfect. 100% of you are correct. So again, the take-home point, if you're BRFD6 or an e-mutant, um, the FDA-approved therapy now is encarafenib plus atuximab. Um, and again, the, the take-home point is we should be giving that demblet as opposed to the triplet. The triplet does not result in better survival and, if anything, has um, more side effects um, and financial toxicity. And more uh, detailed results of that are going to present, be presented at the virtual ASCO um, coming up this weekend. So, um, great. Thank you all so much for your attention. I want to thank you all, and, and um, I hope this was helpful for everyone. All right. And uh, we'll, we'll see if we have just, I know we went over time, but if, if any questions come in uh, in the next minute or so, uh, I'll put that up so that you can uh, respond to those, and I'll look for, for any that, that may come in. Um, and I think what I'll do is, is the question poll is up, and while that's up, I'm going to say my thank yous and do a few other things, let you know about a few other things, and then we'll come back to those questions. So we do want to thank the North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support of the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center through the University Cancer Research Fund. We want to thank uh, Veneranda Obore and Mary King and John Powell for all of the work that they do for each of these lectures, including today's. Uh, we want to uh, remind you that you can always get a hold of us at unccn.org.